to track your distance. Now it tracks your stride length. It knows a breaststroke from a backstroke and checks for temperature changes to estimate when you've ovulated. When you're dreaming, it's measuring your REM sleep down to the minute. And it can detect a serious car crash and call for help. So yeah, a few new things. Tomorrow on ET, our exclusive with country legend Willie Nelson, still booked and busy at 89. Who do you want to still collaborate with? I don't know uh, anybody. Can you say? <laughs> <laughs> no. But we better get ready. Answer Let's go, no, Willie. Willie. That duet is going places. <laughs> hey, before we go, tonight is the season two premiere of CBS's hit comedy Ghosts. We don't even know if that OJ fellow tracks down the real killers. And only E.T. was with this hilarious cast at their CBS Watch Magazine photo shoot. I love this show. It's so much fun. Yeah, it's my boy fun. Udkarsh is hilarious. Night, everybody. Take care. They what? treated me like Beyonce, y'all. Did I tell you this? No. I had, a, I had a, a blower. Happening now. Two different versions of the facts told to a jury today in a murder trial. I don't know. We'll break down that testimony. It's day three of the Jaron Garcia murder trial. I'll break down just how cool it's going to get in various neighborhoods across our area, along with the latest on Ian and how Tropical Storm Orlean in the Pacific will have an impact on our weather. See you in a bit. And concerns over the environment has many turning to green cleaning products. But are they as green as they say? What you need to look out for. The News at 5 starts right now. We begin this evening with late breaking news that came into our newsroom just a little while ago. Officials with NEISD reporting an arrest has been made after a student was found with a gun on campus. Now to be clear here, there was no shooting. No one was hurt. This happened at Churchill High School. And the principal there said in a letter to parents that the student says he was holding that gun for someone else. That student was arrested and is now facing charges. That arrest was made after a student told a teacher that another student may have brought a gun to campus. School staff continue to ask parents to tell their children, if you see something, say something. Now, first at five here, or new at five, I should say, one shooting, two witnesses, two different versions of what happened. That's what jurors heard today in a murder trial. Jaron Diego Garcia is on trial for allegedly killing his stepfather. Today, his mother and brother who witnessed that shooting told different versions of what happened that night. Erica Hernandez breaks down that testimony. Bertha Garcia and her 16-year-old son took the stand in Jaron Diego Garcia's murder trial. Jaron on trial for allegedly killing his stepfather, Mark Ramos, on March 5, 2021. More than a year later, Jaron's 16-year-old brother admitted on the stand he lied to detectives the night of the shooting and claims he witnessed the incident. That night when I was talking to him, I was very shocked and startled. It was, I was nervous. Like, I, I don't see stuff like that. The 16-year-old also says that Ramos was the aggressor, threatening him and his brother and swinging at them. Meanwhile, Berta Garcia's testimony had several inconsistencies. She was often shown her initial statement to police to verify what she was saying today and if it was accurate. I forgot some things. I didn't leave them. I just forgot. Like there's, it would happen so fast. Like I didn't say everything like that I could say. She also says she pleaded for Jaren to put the gun down. Um, telling him and screaming at him and holding the gun telling them not to, that it's not worth it. And while the night of the shooting, she told police Jaron followed Ramos outside, today she said he never walked outside of the home. So, how would bullets and special casings and five rounds get outside? I don't know. This case is not expected to go to the jury until tomorrow. If found guilty, Jaron faces up to life in prison. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. New at five, we have learned the name of a man killed in a DWI crash on the city's north side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office tells us that man is 24-year-old Carlos Moreno. According to police, Moreno was the passenger in a pickup truck this past Sunday. They say the driver of that truck was speeding and weaving in and out of traffic on 281. That truck ended up slamming into a construction zone. Moreno died at the scene. The driver was taken to the hospital and was found to be intoxicated. 
And we're still trying to find out the name of the person who died after a vehicle struck them this morning. It happened around 6 o'clock on 281 near Sunset Road. Police say that person was hit in the southbound lanes. We're told the driver who hit the person stayed there and spoke with police. The families of three children who survived the Robb Elementary shooting in Uvalde filed the first lawsuit in federal court against the Uvalde School District. Law enforcement officials, gun makers and others alleging their negligence and failures contributed to that massacre. The suit was filed today in Texas's Western District Court. According to lawyers, one of the children in the lawsuit was wounded in the shooting and was best friends with one of the students who was killed. In all, the suit names 10 defendants, including the city of Uvalde and the since fired school district chief, police Pete Arredondo. After nearly 50 hours, one of the parents protesting outside of the Uvalde CISD administration office spoke with the superintendent. That meeting between Brett Cross and Hal Harrell was broadcast on social media. In the video, Cross asks Harrell why the officers who were inside Rob Elementary the day of the shooting haven't yet been suspended. Just like the city, just like the sheriff's office, I need those officers. You need five officers, right? You got employed? We got, we got five employed. Mm -hmm. so you need five officers. DPS can't fill in for five officers. Well, my understanding is the work that the campus officers do is different than what DPS is willing to do at this point. Now, a statement from UCISD says that it is engaged with the Texas Police Chiefs Association to conduct a management and organizational review of the Uvalde CISD Police Department. Okay, here's a reminder. This is happening tomorrow. You can watch the only scheduled gubernatorial debate right here on KSAT. We're also going to have, a, we're also going to live stream that debate on KSAT.com. It's taking place at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and our own Steve Spreester is going to be a panelist. He's also going to have, or we will also have, a virtual watch party for our KSAT insiders. We invite you to join us for that. The debate coverage begins at 7 o'clock, and of course, we have more information on our website, KSAT.com. Hurricane Ian made landfall yesterday, leaving behind a trail of debris and destruction across the state of Florida. So we know that cleanup is underway in parts of the state, while other areas are still dealing with the storm. Ashley Harding from our sister station, WJXT in Jacksonville, has more. All eyes are on downtown St. Augustine tonight, taking a look at what it still looks like even hours later after the water breached the seawall by the Bridge of Lines. You can see that people are still walking through shin deep water and it is still creeping up here into the Plaza de la Constitucion. And speaking of that, we want to show you what the other side looks like. You can see that at one point those bicycles were almost halfway submerged. It started to recede a little bit but sandbags are out for local businesses. And if you look over here, other businesses have boarded up as well. And again, if you look straight down to where we're looking, you see that there is still some flood water there. That flash flood warning was in effect until 3.15 this afternoon. But a little bit earlier, we actually did catch a couple of men in the water in a kayak. We spoke to them afterward about why they were doing what they were doing. Obviously, it's uh, devastating, but you know, we're out here seeing what we can make of it. If anybody needs a hand, you know, maybe give them a ride to safety, give a few guys a ride to their car, so trying to help out. Yeah, it's, I'm actually from Brazil, so this is my first time in a hurricane because I remember the last one to end in Dorian, the last one to die in 19 was supposed to hit us, but then it went away. So this is crazy for me. I sent some pictures to my friend in Brazil. They were like, man, that's insane. You crazy. As always, people again advised to be safe. Ashley Harding, Channel 4, the local station. So much damage. It's going to take a long time and a lot of money to fix it all. We want to mention that we will be hosting another phone bank on Monday in partnership with the Red Cross to raise money for relief efforts there in Florida following the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Those phone lines will be open from noon to 7. That's on Monday. And we will release the phone number to call on that day. Yeah. Now we're going to take a live look outside. Look at traffic here. I-10 at the Y. You can see traffic is flowing pretty it looks pretty healthy out there right now. 506, you don't really have, a, yes, cars are going, but not really much traffic or no slowdowns, I should say, in any direction. 
Uh, check out our temperatures earlier this morning. Officially at the airport, 60 degrees again, but many outlying areas dropped down into the 50s. Even Carrizo Springs, 55. Kerrville dropped down to 53 degrees. Bernie, 55, and Seguin, 57. Right now, a far cry from that. It's that time of year where whenever we have the dry air in place, the lack of humidity, we have a huge temperature range from the morning to the afternoon. Still near 90 this afternoon. Leon Springs at 92, Floresville 92, and Windcrest currently at 90. Clear and comfortable this evening. It's more of the same. Low humidity. Temperature 77 by 10 o'clock and by midnight right near 70 degrees. We have a lot to talk about coming up. Take a look at the weather headlines. Remaining cool and fall like in a hurricane again and how tropical storm Orlean will affect us. It's coming in from the Pacific. We'll chat about that in a bit. All right, Adam, thank you. So, you know, one of the biggest decisions that you make in life is choosing a career and hundreds of local students got help with that. Workforce Solutions Career Pathway event took place today. And let me tell you, it was huge. 700 students showed up this year, which is more than twice the amount of people from last year. And there were plenty of employers there for them to speak with. And they represented fields like healthcare, finance, construction, oil and gas. They spoke with students and also gave them advice. And one of the things they told them was how important it is to set up a LinkedIn page once they're 16. It's the best way to get your uh, field of operations open and wide and that more businesses that find out about you earlier on gives you better chances to find a field that you like. And also network. By the way, this event aims to expose students to different opportunities and also teach them how to advance their career once they get one. And by the way, Workforce can help you with that too. Just stop by one of their career centers. There are more than a dozen of them in our area. Still ahead on the News at 5, protecting your private information. Google is rolling out a new tool with that in mind. We'll show you how they hope to keep your private info private. So you've definitely seen that lots of products on the market out there claiming to be green. But are they? We're going to show you how you can tell which ones are actually environmentally friendly. Welcome back. Here's a look at what we're working on for you at six o'clock. For the first time in years, the Rio Grande Valley isn't considered the epicenter of the migrant crisis, but Sister Norma Pimentel says that we still need to help the migrants there. Yeah, she is the director of Catholic Charities in the Rio Grande Valley and has helped establish a respite center that has served hundreds of thousands of migrants over the last eight years. Coming up at six, Alicia Barrera is live in the Rio Grande Valley with more about how her work is helping other cities and states across the U.S. And five million of federal relief dollars doled out today to local artists and art organizations. We're going to tell you how the city chose them and how the money is going to be used. Plus this. His paintings were one way the late artist Alberto Menjangos conveyed his Hispanic heritage without words. Social justice and underlying messages of equity and inequity and pieces that he had experienced as a person of color. In the very same art created by the founding director of the Mexican Cultural Institute. Those stories and more are coming your way today on the News at 6. So here's something that comes as welcome news to many. America's biggest online retailer says that some of its workers will make more money. Amazon announced that the pay bump is going to happen next month. So that means the average starting pay for warehouse workers and delivery drivers will jump to $19 an hour. That raise comes ahead of the busy holiday season and also at a time when Amazon workers in several facilities are planning to unionize. Google is taking steps per, towards protecting your private information. This feature is called Results About You, and it focuses on protecting emails, personal phone numbers, and home addresses from Google searches. The search engine giant says when they receive a request, they will evaluate the content on the web page and decide whether that page should be excluded from searches. The company admits that even if a page is removed from its search results, it will still be online. Next year, Google plans to have a new option available that would send uh, users results uh, when that uh, information is searched. All right, so a lot of people are going green, and that even comes down to their cleaning products. Yeah, but are those products as green as they claim to be? 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz cuts through the hype and shows us what to look for on those labels. 
The cleaning products aisle is packed with green cleaners. But what does saying a product is green even mean? Not much, according to Consumer Reports. Same goes for words like natural, plant-based, non-toxic, and eco-friendly. These are really just marketing terms to make a product seem more appealing. It's sometimes called greenwashing, a gimmick meant to attract consumers who prefer to buy products from environmentally conscious brands. Still many people want to make eco-friendly choices, so start by thinking what part of green is most important to you? Do you want plant-based or biodegradable products? Then look specifically for that. Eco-friendly products may use less plastic in their packaging, but that doesn't mean they're free from harmful chemicals. Another important thing to know is that just because a product is natural or plant-based doesn't mean it's safe. It could even be toxic. That's something you want to be aware of, especially if you have kids around. So how do you choose? Consumer Reports says look for one of these seals of approval from independent groups that check the claims. This seal from UL means a product has lower environmental impact than similar products, like energy and water use. To be EWG verified, products can't include certain ingredients that are potentially harmful. Same goes when you see the EPA's Safer Choice logo. You can even search their website to see if your favorite cleaner got their approval. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, 516. Right now, we're going to take a live look outside. So what you're looking at is Commerce Street. This is a view from Sky 12 right now. That area is going to be fully closed between St. Mary's and Soledad because a crane is going to be removed and that closure is going to continue through Sunday. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that area is going to be closed to traffic. We're telling you that now so that you don't have to deal with any traffic tomorrow and just find an alternate route. All right, aside from the lack of rain, Adam, there is not much to complain about when it comes to our weather right now. No, especially relatively speaking, right? And I know it does feel nice outside. These mornings are feeling good, a little more fall-like, kind of an appetizer for fall. Uh, but unfortunately, we just can't even make rain if we tried. I mean, you can't even order it up in this kind of weather. Our dew points are going to remain low. That means low humidity and a big temperature range from the morning to the afternoon. No big temperature changes though in the days ahead. The mornings are going to remain the same near 60 and in the upper 50s and then afternoons right near 90 degrees or in the upper 80s. So no big, uh, no big temperature changes in terms of the forecast. Then Ian and Orlean to chat about. Norlean is actually in the Pacific. Let's start with a look at Ian, or I should say, well, this says Orlean. This is actually Hurricane Ian right now. It has actually redeveloped into a Category 1 hurricane. Of course, it was downgraded to a tropical storm, and now it's a Category 1 hurricane. Max sustained winds at 80 miles per hour with this. You see most of the action on the north side of the center of circulation. There's the center of circulation and a bit of an eye reforming there. Most of the activity on the north side of that. This is going to be taken basically northward into the South Carolina coastline, somewhere near Charleston to maybe even Myrtle Beach as likely a Category 1 hurricane Friday afternoon, midday-ish. Midday afternoon is when that should make its third landfall. Cuba, Southwest Florida, and then South Carolina area. Then the remnants, as it falls apart, it's still going to rain into North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and hang around the Mid-Atlantic for several days. You can see the rain already stretching up to the outer banks of uh, North Carolina. Now we have Tropical Storm Orlean. This is off the coast of Mexico here. Max sustained winds at 45 miles per hour, a weak system. It's likely, though, to develop into a hurricane in the coming days, and maybe even a Category 2 hurricane, and then make its way into western Mexico. And by the early part of next week, the remnants of this, these get ripped apart when they move over the mountains of Mexico. But some moisture is left over. I wish I could say that's going to bring us some rain, but it's just going to throw some clouds our way. So notice our future cast, nothing but sunshine. Friday, Saturday, and then by Sunday, some of this Pacific moisture moves in from Orlean, and it's really just going to give us some mid and high level clouds Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and maybe even lingering on into Wednesday. But unfortunately, the rainfall, that all stays away from us, and we can't tap into any energy from that. All right, 92 degrees, our high temperature today. The average now 87, and our morning low officially 60, and that's six degrees below average. 91 right now, dew point of 46. It's a nice, crisp, dry air in place, which gives us those mornings near 60, 
but then afternoons 30 degrees warmer. Right now, Bernie 88, Canyon Lake 89, Stinson Airport right now 92 degrees, Uvalde at 88. All right, here's what you can expect tomorrow morning. More of the same, 50s in outline areas, Kerrville 54, Hondo 57, even Gonzales about 55 to start the day. And we're talking 58, Holotus, Timberwood Park 57, Elmendorf 59, probably officially 60 at the airport in town. But then by the afternoon, right back up near 90 degrees, give or take a degree or so. Actually, I think a good portion of our area in the upper 80s tomorrow. Wall to wall sunshine throughout the day again, east southeasterly breeze at only 3 to 10 miles per hour. And then we actually have a little variety in our sky instead of just baby blue sky. We'll have some clouds, some mid and upper level clouds by Sunday into early part of next week. Something to look forward to. Thank you, Adam. All right, Greg Simmons is joining us now. I have a question. What is up with Dak? Well, the big question is when can he actually start throwing the ball? And that yep. doesn't seem the time period of this right now because the swelling is still in that thumb. So when we come back, let's give you an update first on the Spurs are down another player in training camp. I'll tell you why. And Dak Prescott not ready yet. What does that mean to the Cowboys coming forward in the moment? We have our second injury for the Spurs before the preseason even tips off. Joining Keldon Johnson has recovered from a dislocated right shoulder. Now Josh Primo is down after suffering a medial collateral ligament sprain of his left knee. That means he will miss the start of the preseason. But for Zach Collins, who only played in 28 games last year after recovering from an ankle injury that forced him to miss all of the previous season, he's just happy to be healthy. Not being able to like focus on the skills of the game and the thinking of the game and my body and in other ways and just rehabbing an ankle it's been unbelievable it's been uh and i wish i could get those summers back but i can't so i tried to make it up this summer and it was, it was a lot of fun all right first preseason game sunday night in houston Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. With the success of Cooper Rush, is enjoying a quarterback now 3-0, including the 23-16 victory over the New York Giants. There is no reason to rush Dak Prescott's return to the team. We found out on the sidelines of Monday Night Football that Dak had his stitches removed from surgery on his right thumb and fractured in the season opener against Tampa Bay. And with that, his recovery can now be ramped up. Head coach Mike McCarthy was asked to provide an update on his conditioning. He's been conditioning, so uh, he's been able to do that, uh, th I think, after the first week. So um, he'll just continue on the, the path, you know, with the cardiovascular. But, you know, now that he has the stitches out, I mean, you know, the next step is to get the swelling uh, totally out of the, you know, the, the joint and, the, you know, the thumb area. And then, you know, to start to build the strength, uh, you know, so he can grip the football. That's the next step. So really no timetable at this point until the swelling goes down to where you can kind of start the clock on throwing and all of that. Do I look like the timetable guy? <laughs> <laughs> that means Cooper Rush will be your starting quarterback this Sunday when the Cowboys host the Washington Commanders. Houston Texans have yet to win a game this season. So far, a tie is the best they've been able to do. 2020 tie in their season over against the Colts. Since that time, they've lost back-to-back -back road games to Denver and Chicago and have yet to score a single point in the fourth quarter against the Bears. Quarterback Davis Mills gave up a late interception off a tip ball to lead their 23-20 loss. Is Mills feeling any pressure from the team to step up his game? There's pressure as being the starting quarterback. I'm not looking that far ahead of it. I'm taking this, I mean, really one practice at a time, one week at a time right now. So I'm just going out there, putting my best foot forward each day for my teammates, I'm trying to win games. The Texans will be back at home this Sunday when they host the Chargers at noon. I still say the Texans should have used one of their little draft picks for a quarterback. Just in case. But you're not in charge. I'm not. Not at all. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back after this. All right. Thank you so much for joining us during this half hour. Thank you for watching the news at 5. World News is next. We'll see you back here at 6. Yeah.